And welcome to Ask the Expert. To kick off today's events, we will be learning about comic arts. My name is Asel Musios. I'm a reporter for GBH News and a comic enthusiast. Uh, first, thanks to everyone for being here, uh, including our leadership circle and RLS members. We really appreciate y'all's continued support. Before, before we get started, I just want to introduce the team behind the events uh, who will help to sort of guide everyone and tell, tell y'all what's going on. Uh, first, uh, we have Bailey, who's our event producer. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you here. Um, just real quick, um, just so you know, we cannot see or hear you on the back end. So if you're chilling with pajamas or have like a cup of coffee, we cannot see you. Um, we hope you enjoy the event. Thank you so much for being here. And then uh, we also have Abby, who's going to be hanging out in the Q&A tab and who can tell you more about that. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Esteban. Welcome. We want to hear from you. So open up that Q&A tab at the bottom. Type in your questions, type in your comments. Definitely let us know where you're joining us from. We can't see you, so we wanna pretend that we are all here connected. See a question you wanna hear asked? Vote for it by clicking the thumbs up. Great, great. Well, without further ado, uh, I wanna to introduce today's guest. Uh, Joel Christian Gill, is, uh, he's, you know, he, he does everything. He's, he's, a, he's, a car, he's a cartoonist, he's a writer. Uh, his, some of his work is, uh, includes Strange Fruit, Uncelebrated Narratives from Black History, um, Tales of the Talented Tenth, talented tenth uh, Fights, One Boy's Triumph Over Violence, which just came out, came out this year. Um, and then he's also working on, a, uh, on an adaptation of Dr. Eber X. Kendi's Stamp from the Beginning, a, a Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. Uh, you could have seen his work in the Boston Globe, the New Yorker, NBC. Uh, and yeah, like I said, he's, he, he, his resume speaks for himself. Uh, Joel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and answer some questions. Yeah. Um, so just, just to kick things off, you know, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, I, I saw in an interview before that, that you, you really sort of think of yourself, not as, you know, an illustrator, um, but a, as a cartoonist, um, so I guess, could you, could you explain, I mean, for, for you, what, what's, what's the difference between the two? It sort of seems you, you take pride in not just being able to draw, but really uh, create your own narratives yourselves. Yeah, I think you, when you think about um, comics and um, what, what we do as cartoonists, it, there, I think there are two types of illustrators that work with comics. There are, there are comic book illustrators and then there are cartoonists. Um, and comic book illustrators typically work collaboratively with a with a writer to to develop a story. So it's more of a team effort. And a cartoonist is someone who I think is the person who wants to be a true auteur of the entire work. You want to you want to write, you want to draw it, you want to do the character designs. You really like you if you're you're writing a story about Thomas Jefferson. Like I'm doing stamped, and so like I'm the kind of person that has to like know what kind of shoes Thomas Jefferson is wearing when he signs the Declaration of Independence. Like I want to be that guy, and I think that and there's nothing wrong with working there's no like the difference between those two things is this you have to have more skills to do other ones but there's nothing wrong with defaulting to the other one where you want to just be a, someone who draws comics and you want to work with the writer and be that you know be that work on that collaborative team they are amazing collaborative teams jack kirby and stan lee there are lots of those people that are out there in the world i just typically like honestly i just like i don't like working with writers <laughs> so <laughs> that's not, not anything against writers it's just like you know one more person that you have to talk with in in order in in addition to the editor so um i think um you just like a cartoonist is somebody who actually does it all it's like combining writing and art yeah yeah you know, I, I don't know about you but i remember just me personally you know, I'm, I'm not you know, I, I don't i'm not necessarily artistically talented in any way but um i do remember you know, coming up as a kid you know when you could still go and buy comic books from grocery stores been a Rex. Uh, and uh i remember probably the first experience i had uh really getting invested in like a specific uh storyline was um when uh when dc did the batman hush storyline this was back in like the early 2000s yeah yeah Moe and jim lee um whose work both both you know who's jim lee whose work i think is, is really great so I guess for, for you, you know, coming up uh, as a kid, was there anybody, was there any artist's work um, that you saw either in comic books or anywhere else where you're like, that's what I want to do or that inspired you? 
Um, you know, I spent a lot of time drawing out of Mad and Cracked magazine. Um, being as poor as I was, I wouldn't always get, like, you couldn't just go out and buy comics all the time. So, like, it was one of those things, if I was going to buy something, I wanted something that had a lot of words in it. So it had a lot of pages. And Cracked and Mad magazine always had more pages than, like, the floppies that you get in the spinner racks. And so, um, I, like, I spent a lot of time reading and drawing out of Mad and Cracked and copying that stuff. So, um, you know, Mort Drucker was somebody I, I copied a lot. Um, I mean, I just copied a lot of those things. And um, that was kind of, that was probably like my intense sort of like period of like introduction to comics. And then when I got into high school, um, you know, I read, like I read like the D, like, you know, it, one of the things that was really funny about me is I really liked one shots. Um, and so like Elseworlds were a big deal for me when I was a kid. Um, cause I really liked the changing of the, the alternative idea of the story. And then, um, about the same time image came out. So I'm a huge, I was a huge spawn fan and like, I wanted to be Todd McFarlane and I was like copying his stuff. And, um, I had, you know, Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, Wills Potato, um, you know, like all of those image guys, even Rob Liefeld, everybody makes fun of now, but you know, like you can't, you, you can't hate the you can't hate the um, player. You got to hate the game. Right. So, yeah. uh, and so like, I was a big fan of all those things. So that was, that was, that was how I felt about it. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you, you brought up Todd McFarlane and, I, and you know, that's someone who sort of did what, what you did, you know, he, he illustrated and then he also, he's like, I just, I want to do my own stories, you know, I want to yeah. create spawn. So the, the seeing that, um, the, the, that sort of set up, you know, sort of make you think like, Oh, like, you don't have to follow sort of the traditional route of like illustrator, writer, work together. You can do it all yourself. Yeah, but I, what I would say this though, specifically about um, Image and anybody that knows the history of Image, like their books were so, um, they were so late all of the time because that's a harder thing to do, right? Like the reason that we put, the reason that there's a inker and there's a colorist and there's a penciler and then there's an editor and there's a writer because they're all those different things is because it's like, it's hard to do a 24 page book in a 28 day period. And so they would break it up. And so when, um, when Spawn first came out, I think number one came out in like October. I think number two came out almost a year later or like six months later. And so they were, they were systemically like late on all those books. So they would advertise for books. Um, and so it took them a while to figure out to get like the process right so that they're no longer late on books because that's what, that's why it was. And so, um, but yeah, like that was the thing that I think was really interesting is those guys were writing and um, they were coming up with their own properties. They were, they were owned by them. So like an image still does the same. They do it. They do. They still have a similar um, format where the creator comes in and they're under the image band um, bandwagon, but they own the, the property and they print it under an image imprint. So um, yeah, I think um, seeing those guys do that when I was younger was like, that was the thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to write and draw comics as opposed to just drawing the comics. I, there was a, my mom went on vacation. Um, my, like when I was in like 11th grade and um, so she went on vacation and I didn't want to go. And so she was like, all right, I'm going to leave, I'm going to let you stay here. And you would think, you know, me and my homies would have like big parties or whatever in the house. And we did. And we ended up painting giant comic book covers on the walls of my bedroom. <laughs> That's what we ended up doing. So um, it was pretty great. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, looking at, at the sort of work that, that you do now, you know, it's, I think when people think about comic books, uh, they often think of, you know, superheroes. Um, and that's not really where your, what your work really is, you know, not the traditional sort of, you know, cape uh, superheroes. Uh, wh so wh when did you sort of decide like, oh, actually, I think I want to focus more on my work on, on historical figures? Um, I think that was more about, um, that was more about like my idea, like, so, so the, when I first started drawing comics, it was because I was failing telling my own stories and painting. And I wanted to draw comics when I was a kid, but I wanted to be you for painting. And um, my paintings weren't telling the stories that I wanted them to. And so what I ended up doing was um, like basically getting a, in what I call a library degree. And anybody out there who's listening, if you, um, if you want a library degree, it's really easy. All you need is a library card and you just need to go to the library and just read as much as you can about a thing. And as I was like 
as I was cyber stalking a bunch of cartoonists and like looking at all their work and trying to figure out as much as I could about them, I came across Box Brown, who's a cartoonist, Brian Box Brown, who's a cartoonist who's done a number of different books. And so I Googled his name and the story of Henry Box Brown, who was a slave who mailed himself in a box from Virginia to Philadelphia to escape from slavery to freedom. And I thought, this is a really, this is a really amazing story. Um, and so I stole that idea from his name and uh, because he actually I sent him a message and I'm like you're a white kid in Philadelphia why are you named Box Brown and he was like my I'm square shaped so my friends call me Box but I think maybe one day I'll do a story about that guy and I'm like that's a really great idea I'm gonna steal it and so I drew the story of Henry Box Brown and so by doing these little obscure black history stories it was a way for me to develop it was a way for me to practice how to tell a narrative. And so, because everything is already set, you got a character, you've got a character, you got a story arc, you've got character development, you've got plot points, you got a beginning, middle and end, you have all of these different things that you need in the story. So it was a way for me to understand how stories work um, while I'm trying to draw. And so that's how I ended up doing it. And then this interesting thing happened when I did my first, um, when I did the first um, book signing for Strange Fruit after, um, after, um, after it was published, you know, I had been thinking that comics were um, like these comics that I was drawing were like little inf these things that were for um, hipsters. Like hipsters will spend nine dollars on avocado on toast, so I'm, I'm sure they will buy these little comics about Black history that I'm drawing, and um, <laughs> so. I, so I went, so that's what I was thinking in my head, like interesting stories about black history. And I went to a book signing and the guy came up to me and he had tears in his eyes. And he was like, you know, I, he got, he says to me, he was like, thank you for telling these stories. And it realized, and at that moment, like, I mean, I knew these stories were interesting, were important, right? But I didn't realize how important these stories were. And so it almost like lit a fire under me to like tell as many of these stories as I possibly can. Um, and like thinking about like the world that we live in now um, and, you know, like the, the contributions that black and brown people have made, we, we you know, like black people make up like 13.3% of the population, but how much of the culture do we actually, do we actually, um, do we actually um, contribute to, right? The number one selling music in America is hip hop. One of the number one musics in the world is hip hop. And that's an American export, which is like de definitively from black people, right? Mm -hmm. um, our style is from, you know, we, we contribute predominantly to style. And so America is like ours, right? Just as much as it is anybody else's. And so what I'm trying to do with the sharing of these stories is to show you how American black people are so that we no longer be considered the, the you know, the exotic other, right? This is my country as, this is my country as well as it is anyone else's. Um, and I think that's the thing that we're fighting this constant, you know, like that's what I'm trying to do with Strange Fruit, Tales of the Talented Tenth, and telling these stories about black history is to show people that these stories, this, this history is our history and this country is our country. And if you don't believe me, here's the proof. Here's how these people have been here for a long time. Here's these things that they are doing that are quintessentially American things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joel, we have a, a, a we're, we're getting some some questions in the Q and A tab. I want to get to, and just a reminder, uh, please, if, to anybody who, who's watching today, if you have any questions uh, for for Joel, please use uh, ask through the Q and A uh, tab. Um, first, we have uh, Jim from Wellesley, uh, and he asks, "Do animated films of the last twenty years provide any inspiration or influence your work in any way?" Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there are lots of people who are making some really amazing things in animation. Um, I look at like a lot of the stuff that's just on television, like um, um, She-Ra on Netflix, Steven Universe, um, um, Adventure Time, like all of those, these telling these untraditional, unconventional type stories with um, diverse characters is a really, really amazing thing um, that's happening right now. And so um, I look at a lot of that stuff. Yeah, so absolutely. There are a lot of things out there in the world that um, I'm really inspired by. And, and at some point, hopefully, I'll be able to turn some of my work into animations as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one, one of the other questions, and something I, I neglected to mention uh, in your in your uh, your resume, you're also an associate professor of illustration at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. And uh, one of the questions we have is: when you look at a student application, this is from uh, from Michelle. When you look at a student application for the comic arts program that you chair, uh, what do you look for? Um, what do you think are good skills and experiences for candidates to have? Um, 
I have art and the question is I have art and design students who might be interested. Um, so I am no longer chair of comic arts that was at the previous institution. So now I'm just an associate professor, but I'll speak as if I was if I'm still there. So just thinking about how um, art and design, like how, what I'm looking for. So specifically with comics, um, I'm looking for people who can write and draw stories. Um, and, um, and that is, it's a really complicated thing because most people think, well, you need to be able to draw this hand so super well that it looks like an anatomically correct hand. And I'm like, that's super important. Don't get me wrong, that's important. But it's not the most important thing. So think about it in terms of like reading a story. If you're reading a book, and um, let's just say you're reading your favorite, you're reading The Hobbit, right? You're reading The Hobbit, you're on the first page, you're on the first couple pages here and there back, right? So you flip over and the next page is all in German, right? So you're immediately taken out of the story when you actually flip the page and it's in a different language. So comics are like that in that in a similar way. So if I have a story, if I have something that's drawn too well, I'm no longer paying attention to the story. If I have something that's drawn not too drawn poorly, then I'm no longer paying attention to the story. What you want to have happen is comics is kind of like a dance, right? And there's this book called Unflattening that was writ um, written a couple of years ago by Nick Sosanis. I'm going to get his name wrong. Um, but um, he, um, he wrote his dissertation in comics and he wrote it as a graphic novel. And in that book, he says that comics are like a dance. It's words and pictures working together. And so I'm looking for people who are interested in telling stories, but the mode in which they want to tell stories is by drawing them. And so when I was running comic arts, that's what I would be looking for. I would be looking for students who could tell a story. So like a little bit of writing, a little bit of art and combining those two things together to tell you, to tell your story. So that's, that's really what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about people who could tell stories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another uh, great question um, from this is this one's from Olivia, and this is actually referring to something you said earlier. Uh, you mentioned wanting to know what Jefferson's shoes look like. Um, can you talk a little bit about your research process? How do you go about finding the answer to a question like that uh, in order for you to create what you do? So um, because there are no pictures of Jefferson, right? There's no like photographs. I can't just like put, you know, Jefferson, like type in Jefferson at the beach right, to get like ideas of what Jefferson looked like. So um, what I typically do when I'm looking at historical figures is I try to find paintings, um, paintings of clothing, paintings of them, you know, paint full figures of those people. Sometimes it's not just the, like I'm looking for Jefferson, but I'm like looking for a crowd of men in 1776. And so I tend to like look up artists who've made paintings about those. And I also look up fashion guides too. Sometimes you can find um, fashion guides in some school, some places, some schools actually have entire fashion departments where they have a history of costumes. So you could like look on their websites to find that stuff. So like that's typically what I do when I'm looking for um, when I'm doing re I'm research. But, you know, one of the things about my research is really interesting. Um, and um, I get questions about this all the time is that because I'm doing obscure black history, like I have to really dig for things. Like when I did my story about Bessie Stringfield, I actually had to find people who knew Bessie Stringfield to get information about her because there was very little information about her in the world. So it's like looking at blog posts, who wrote this blog post, seeing if I can email that person, giving them a call and talking to them on the phone so I can get information about that stuff. So it's a really involved process. It's actually fun though, because when you find something that you've been looking for it's like the best feeling in the world <laughs> like you like i've been looking for this like all the time and you find it it's just like it's like winning something so yeah and i i have a I, there's more questions in the q a tab but I, have, I have a follow-up to that myself um when you like you said there's i think there's so much um history that hasn't been either adequately um covered or, or just not covered at all especially when it comes to black history have you ever found someone that you that you cover that that you illustrated you did the story and you sort of realized oh i'm i may be the first person really doing this story justice at all i don't know about i don't i mean i don't think about it like that i don't um i mean i might be the first person to actually like i discover people right and like i'd write a story about people that nobody's heard about but i don't feel like i've ever thought to myself like i'm the first person doing justice to this person um you know more my stories are more you know, I think about what I do is like sharing a conversation. It's just like, I just, I'm just able to do it on a macro level as opposed to a micro level. Like before we, before we had, before we came live, you and I were talking about just Virginia and hip hop and all this other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you do when you have a conversation. You share little bits and pieces of yourself with somebody. <coughs> Excuse me. And when you do that, 
you actually build you build like rapport and it actually humanizes that person right and so what i do with my work on a macro level is thinking about these black people and i'm like i'm my my goal is for little white kids and and white young adults and white people in general to look at these stories and go you know what these are ours this is our story right i want them to have the same kind of feel the same kind of ownership to those stories that i do because only then will you start thinking about this as being our our country not the country for those people and the country for those people it's ours as a whole so that's what i'm trying to do is trying to create that empathy for um for the for black people in general and sometimes i feel like i'm you know there are days when i'm like i'm doing it it's the best thing ever like i i've gotten through and then there's some please days where i just like i like like my shirt says, I can't breathe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and th that actually is, is a good segue into the next question from, uh, from the Q&A tab. Um, this one's from Sean. Uh, with less black writers than white writers in the comic book field, uh, do you personally feel that white writers can successfully write for black characters? Um, and, and he says, as a white writer myself, I want to create realistic characters of all races. So um, this is a really complicated question. And I think um, a lot of people get into trouble because they don't. So there's a couple of ways to go about it, right? It's to, to ignore that you're writing about a black character and just happen to make them black. It's to, or it's to do stereotypical black things. And I think what you have to do in those situations is talk to people, everybody, um, and to observe things in a, I mean, I wrote a book about um, Bessie Stringfield. Um, I wrote two books about Bessie Stringfield, who was a black woman in the 1940s and 50s. I, like, I know about the black part, but I don't know about the woman part. And so, so in order to, to make sure that I'm asking appropriate questions and I'm writing this in an appropriate way that I'm not, I'm not adding um, the male gaze onto Bessie Stringfield. I talk to my daughters and my wife and my children and my sisters and my nieces. Like I talk to a lot of people about that. And I think that's the important thing is to make sure that, so the, the thing about black characters, specifically just black characters in stories, um, number one, Black shouldn't be, that, that shouldn't be something that, that, that defines that person. You don't make them the magical Negro, right? You don't make them, you know, the voodoo priestess. You don't give them like some exotic sort of magical black power, right? Um, Cause that's not gonna, that's not the way it works. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, they shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have, there, there shouldn't be like a white savior narrative in your stories. Um, I'm, I'm sure that the, the, the questioner didn't have that in mind, but there shouldn't be a white, they should, they, they should have agency, the character should have agency. And when you're trying to figure out what your character, what, what black characters have agency, um, look at people who have done for themselves. Like there's some amazing stories out there about um, LGBTQIA plus black people, women, black women, the cross section between black women and um, LGBT, like the intersectionality of those things and ask questions. Uh, that's the most important thing. People get in trouble because they just assume that they can't be racist because they black they have black friends and they're doing this thing where they're putting stories together that is that is diversity because they they put a person in there but not thinking about like how do these characters have agency and i think that's the most important part make sure that your characters have agency that they can that they move through a world in a way that's realistic to the to the environment that the person is in right right um Another question uh, and, and that we got from our Q&A tab, which I think you've sort of touched on this a little bit, Joel, but um, this is from Nelson. Do you have a particular, a particular audience in mind uh, when you're working on your stories or, uh, or are you thinking of anybody in particular? How does that sort of work? Um, typically, I just want everybody to read the stories, right? Um, I, um, I mean, I'm an author and I sell books, right? So there's that. So like, everybody. <laughs> so I want all of you to buy my books and I want you all to buy multiple copies and send them to people who will also look at the books and go, you know what? I want to buy multiple copies of this book as well. That's like my audience. Um, but, you know, I just try to tell good stories. And I think if you're someone who likes good stories and stories that are, that are, that matter, I mean, it's not, you know, like it's, it's not really a, it's not really a group of people who like really like sci-fi, right? That's not the audience that I'm drawing for. Um, I'm drawing for people who like history, who like 
um, this I, who likes these gems of history that we don't always find. Um, but I don't really think about an age group or um, or like a target audience. I want it to be broad. So I want I want somebody to pick up my book who who can read and who will find this interesting, right? So like a kid might pick it up in the library. They might be eight. Um, they can read that book. Um, they can take it home, read it, put it on the table, not worry about it. Their you know uncle who comes in who's in his twenties might pick it up and go, oh, this is, this seems dope, and then open it up and they find it and read it and enjoy it. Or like a grandma who comes in and reads it might pick it up and go, oh, this is really great. Or Because most of the time, I, I think most people don't know this, but the black history that I'm telling, there's an entire generation of people who already knew those stories. And those are the people who spent time in segregated schools. Because like black people learned about black history when they were when the schools were segregated and when they were desegregated, we we lost a lot of that history as well. So like you know, my mom will read my mom reads her story and I'll tell somebody tell my mom something and she'll go, Oh yeah, I knew about that. Like <laughs> of course, you know. Yeah. So I try to I try to I want a broad audience basically. Right, right. Um a question from uh, from an anonymous user, but what advice would you give to young artists uh, who might be interested in, in getting into the field? Um, you have to draw all the time, draw all the time, like drawing all the time should be the thing that you want to do. It's, you should carry a sketchbook. You should just like, I mean, I work digitally, but I have, I have a note, a galaxy note. So I draw on my phone. I have an iPad. I draw on my iPad when I have my backpack. And when the world is not in apocalypse mode, when I'm walking around the world, I have a sketchbook in my backpack that I'm walking around with that I'm drawing in. Um, so draw all the time. And if you want to write, if you want to do comics, then write too. So like not just draw, but write. And when you write, don't, it's not necessarily you're writing um, like you're always writing stories, just write observations, just like practice writing. Cause that, I think that's really important. Um, practice writing what you saw, what you did, what's interesting, write about what you just drew, why you just drew it, those kind of things. I think that's going to be really, um, that, that'll, that will be really helpful moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Martha, uh, who, and just a reminder, please, if, if you have any more uh, questions, make sure to, to put them in the Q&A tab. Uh, Martha asks, uh, do you ever get stuck and slap something together even when your heart isn't in it, you know, just to get along um, and hope something more inspiring will arrive eventually? Um, if this is the same Martha that I know, hi, Martha. Um, <laughs> I, um, no, I don't do that. Um, I mean, I did that at some point, um, but, now I like I just don't if I don't if my heart's not in it I just don't do it um and I think that's an like the way to be successful in any field whether you're a doctor or whether you're a cartoonist is to be passionate about you what you do and to hustle right and if I am not passionate about something I, I don't do it. If somebody, even if somebody's trying to pay me to do it, if I'm not passionate about it, like, cause I won't be able to like get up in the morning and do it. It'll become a job to me. Like I want to do something that's actually really important to me. And, um, and some that, and those, you know, like, and that's, that's the problem, right? The, you get people, I mean, we all know artists and, you know, people who we think are creatives who slap together an album, who slap together a book or, you know, who, you know, like mailed it on, mailed it in in this movie that they did, right? We've all seen our favorite actor, you know, do a commercial, right? Don't do things that are not, you know, like your, if your heart's not in it, right? Like that's, I think that's part of the problem, right? I'm not going to just do it for the money. Um, and that, and that, that isn't to say that I haven't done that because I have, and, and it was doing it, doing those things that made me think, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's not going to be a thing that I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just as a follow up to that, I mean, we talk about writer's block all the time. Uh, is there an artist's block? Is there, is Absolutely. there, yeah. Um, and when you, when you have artist block, then the thing you do is practice your craft, right? Um, I don't know how I like, I don't really think about it in terms of writing because writing and drawing is so connected to me. So like, if I'm having writer's block, I just like, I just write like about what happened, right? I just write about a day, like just write about what happened that day and that will help you. And the same thing with, um, with cartoonists when you're drawing, uh, if you feel like you can't create anything, that's when I like practice figure drawing. I practice drawing hands. I practice doing perspective, you know, like, cause those things I don't have to really think about, um, in the same way I don't have to be creative about it. I just have to like nail it right and that's a good time to do that um if you don't feel like drawing all together that's when you clean up your studio um that's when you stretch canvases that's when you you know that's when you organize your colored pencils or something you do all of these things when you're working on your when you're working on your work 
when you're working. And I think that's the, that's the dedication to your process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a, a question here from Sandy who says, uh, my kids who are age 11 and nine have been reading graphic novels for a couple of years now. Uh, whereas when I grew up, I didn't read them at all. How important do you think comics and graphic novels are to young kids and to encourage, and to encourage early readers? Uh, luckily, our kids' teachers always say reading is reading, no matter. Reading what. is reading. Um, it's 100% reading. And, you know, just as a shout out to a friend of mine, Jerry Kraft, who just won the Newbery for his book, The New Kid. Um, mm -hmm. This is like comics. One of the things that I, you know, I always say librarians love me um, because comics and library, comics are a way to increase recidivism, like people coming back into the library. Um, it cre increases foot traffic, right? So like that's a number, that's a number one thing. And people used to say like reading comics was not real reading, but it's 100% real reading. Um, and when you have good stories, you don't even realize you're reading it. You just really like you're, that's what, that's how you can tell if you're reading a good comic is when you're not thinking about the pictures and you're not thinking about the words and you're thinking about the story. Um, and so I think specifically for reluctant readers, kids who are reluctant readers, giving them a book that's a comic that could be about history, math, science, or whatever. If it's a comic, it's a sneaky way to teach them, right? You're teaching them something and they don't even realize they're learning because they're interested in this thing that's happening in front of them. It's like watching a really interesting TV show that happens to have facts in it. Yeah, yeah, and, and to, echo, to echo your point, you know, I remember just, um, you know, as a kid going to the library and the first place I'd make a beeline to was the comic section. Um, yeah. and it made you, like you said, it made you want to come back because you'd see Batman and Superman and you see all these, these things that you're really interested in, uh, you know, as a, as a 12 year old boy. And then, and then like, oh, actually there's other books here too. Maybe I should, I can try some of those. Exactly. Uh, and it works and it, it really works. Um, we we're bringing so many great questions here from the audience. Uh, thank you for everybody. But before uh, we go any further, uh, I just want to bring on my colleague, Jamie, uh, who's going to talk more about, about GBH. Uh, Jamie, how are you? I'm great, Esteban. How are you? Good, thank you. I've been really enjoying this conversation. Um, and to our viewers at home, I want to thank you so much for sending, spending some time with us this afternoon during today's Ask the Expert event. You know, WGBH offers a wide variety of events to expand your knowledge on a variety of topics from fly fishing and glass blowing to birding and to comic arts, what we're talking about today. And these events are all made possible thanks to people like you. If you haven't already, we encourage you to make a donation or to become a sustaining member. GBH keeps you covered in more ways than one. Support GBH today at $7.50 a month. That's $90 a year. And we will send you this WGBH t-shirt behind me as a token of our appreciation. Show you're a fan of GBH and Ask the Expert when you go out wearing this now vintage WGBH shirt before the W is gone for good. It's a soft poly cotton blend, so comfortable and fashionable at the same time. You will look good and feel good wearing it. This is a limited time offer only. Go to gwgbh.org slash support events, make a donation, and receive this t-shirt as our thank you gift. Again, that's gbh.org slash support events. What better way is there to show your support of GBH and our Ask the Expert series than by wearing this shirt? Go to wgbh.org slash support events now. Your support helps GBH keep going strong. Back to you, Esteban. Thank you, Jamie. And, uh, and just so y'all know, it's a really good deal. I work for GBH and I don't even have that shirt. Um, so please, you know, any, any support that, that you could give us would be greatly appreciated. Um, Joel, getting back to some of the, uh, the questions that, that, that we're getting here from, from our audience. Uh, Luis has, says, you know, I'm doing historical research um, that I'm actually turning into, uh, into graphic novels. Uh, what do you think about fictionalizing those parts of a person's life that you cannot find in any documents? Um, I mean, that's what you have to do. Um, like if you're telling us, I mean, as long as you're being honest about the idea that this is a story, right? Like um, the stories that 
that you're telling is the story of that person. And if that, if there's a hole in there, you have to feel it some way, somehow, as long as it's not something outlandish, right? Like it's not gonna be, you know, like they invented Dr. Pepper <laughs> in this period you couldn't find, right? Um, you wanna make sure that it's in character and it's like representative of what the person um, was, was doing. Like, I, like example, um, this book, this is um, Fast Enough, Bessie Stringfield's First Ride. This is um, my only picture book. And in this book, I, um, I created a story about a real person and it's um, Bessie Stringfield, who was the first black woman to crisscross the United States on a motorcycle. And, um, and so this is a story of her growing up in like in a neighborhood with these boys who say she's not fast enough, right? That's a fictionalized story about a real person. But the story that I wrote about Bessie Stringfield is really indicative of her life, right? She was, you know, this black woman who was um, five foot two and rode motorcycles all over the country. So like that, that's an indicative story, part of the story about that woman. So you actually have to like build these things in. Um, and sometimes you truncate things, sometimes you change things, as long as it doesn't change too much and you don't, um, I remember like when I was in high school reading um, Malcolm X, because I read Malcolm X like a couple of times, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and then I saw the movie and being real mad with Spike Lee because Spike Lee didn't, because um, he like changed some of the characters and he combined them. But then I drew my own story, Fights, um, One Boy's Triumph Over Violence, and it's like a lot of people in this book that I combined into a couple of people. And so like there are like reasons that we go about doing that. And I think it's perfectly valid to do that as long as you are staying true to who that person was. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, it, like, I think I think just from reading other things, I mean, it, it, it must be difficult to, you know, you can't you can't put every single detail of someone's life into- Right, you, know, you have to pick and choose. You have to think about what's important and you have to think about what the through line is. So like um, right now I'm working on the, the adaptation of Stamped and Ibram sent me a document that has all of the most important points that he wants to hit in the book. And so I have to make sure I hit those points and then also trying to find out what else I wanna to add to that. And I can't add everything. Like you just can't add everything about a person's life, all the stuff they written or anything else. So you just have to be really careful about what you do, making sure that it stays true to what you're, what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have another question here from Neil, uh, who asks, a lot of people have traditionally looked to comics for entertainment. Uh, can you talk about cartoonists as activists, for instance, in support of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, like there are like, um, I don't know if you got if you haven't taken a look at there's a there's a comic magazine called The Nib that you can get online. You can get it delivered to you. It's um, it's mostly free. You've probably seen some of them. And there's a lot of people that I know who are making comics that are um, that are legitimately about um, the issue. I mean, as artists, that's what we do. We make work that's about us and about who we are. Um, one of the people that I can think of automatically has been Passmore, who um, did a comic called Your Black Friend. And um, he, he does these comics about like Black Lives Matter and Antifa and like fascism and like fighting against those things. And so, um, and then there's an entire movement um, called Afrofuturism, which takes the same ideas, but it puts it in a fantastic or a science fiction concept. Um, people like John Jennings, who's working on that, Stacey Robinson, who's a friend of mine, like these are all people, um, Nalo Hopkinton, um, um, Nalo Hopkins, um, um, Nettie Okafor, like there are lots of artists who are, who are creating these, this work that, that mimics in some areas and also um, is metaphors for other things about violence and in Black Lives Matter. And I think that's really important. I mean, you know, as a, as, as a, as a Black artist living today, um, my work is going to be intrinsically about that um, because that's, you know, that's what I, that's how I feel strongly about, that's what I feel strongly about. And to ignore it um, would be, would, I think would be, um, I think it would be, un it would be irresponsible on my part to ignore the world around me and try to just make make art because and the and the reason that I say it would be irresponsible it's probably not irresponsible but definitely um, I would I mean I, I I don't think I can do it right I you know like I, I I'm to be really honest like I live in like I said I live in Wiconda which is uh, in New Hampshire I always tell people I live in Wiconda um, I, I live a pretty charm life I'm a professor I live in a big house in the middle of the country. Um, and, um, and, you know, I can work from home, I can do a lot of things. So a lot of the things that happen to people 
outside of here, including having the black people outside of here, other than microaggressions, I don't, I don't have that constant threat, right? I don't have the constant threat of police brutality. The police don't police my neighborhood, over police my neighborhood. Um, but the problem with that is that I don't, um, the problem with that is that I can't turn off not caring about people. Like I care about what happens to people outside of my family group. And so that's going to seep into my work, whether I want it to or not, because it's happening, right? It's happening around me and I care about people. I care about what happens in Kentucky and Louisville. I, I care about what happens to people like Breonna Taylor, Taylor or Elijah McClain. I care about those things. And so that's gonna seep into my work because I'm passionate about that stuff and it's what I care about. And I can't really separate those things. Yeah, yeah. And just just followed by that, I mean, you know, I think one of the things that that distinguishes your work is, you know, you're you really pride yourself on, on, on being a, a, an historian. Um, so how do you keep up uh, you know, as, as a historian with just the year the 2020 um, and, and just trying to keep a record of that through, you know, through, through your work? Um. Yeah, that's, it's, that's a whole thing. Um, I saw a t-shirt on Instagram the other day and it had, it was like a Yelp review and it says 2020, one star would not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's legitimately how I feel about it. But, um, but I have to put it in context, right? Like I have to, I have to put this in the context of, of what I can do, what, what I can do with my voice. And, and so um, there are long stretches of time where I don't, like I don't go on social media and I don't look at the news because it's, it's troubling, right? It's like doom scrolling, right? I can't just keep scrolling and looking at bad stuff after bad thing after bad thing. But at the same time, I need to be abreast of what's going on around me in the world. So I have to stay focused and I have to stay focused. And there's a quote by Dr. King that always, rem that I always remember in these times. And I keep coming back to it when we're in 2020 and we're seeing all these things that's happening. And as a historian, I have to remember that this is true because it's actually, it's actually borne out if you look at it, that um, the, the, the arm of justice is, the, the, the arm of um, society is long, but it bends toward justice, right? Um, something like that, I'm paraphrasing and, and botching it, but you know, as much as I see how we have grown as a country in, in certain places, I also see how we've regressed as a country. Um, but, you know, I have, I take heart in the fact that there are so many more people. Like I said, I live in White Conda and I drive down the road now and I see Black Lives Matter signs in people's yards. Um, that's, that's telling me that there are other people who don't necessarily look like me who actually believe the thing that I believe. Um, I, you know, like you hear, you know, what Angela Davis said in, an, um, in a racist society, it's not it's not enough to be not racist, you have to be anti-racist. And, and when she said that 40 years ago, that was a very, um, that was a very um, controversial statement. And now it's on everybody's lips. How do we be anti-racist? How do we actively do that? And that's thanks to Dr. That 100% 100% is thanks to Dr. Kennedy's work. But at the same time, um, that's, you can see that actually happening in the world. My wife just did, you work, she works for a, for a corporate company and they just had an entire presentation that they sent her to. So I can see that things happening. And so like, I think it's just like, I have to hold on to hope. And then, you know, in, in the days that I, when I can't hold on to hope, I just watch basketball because <laughs> that, that at least is a little separate, but you know, basketball players are really angry about it too now. So like I, I get a little bit of it now, but at least it's, it's people who are just as angry as I am. Got you. Uh, you're from Virginia, which is a, a sort of a weird spot for, for basketball in terms of like the NBA. Uh, wh who's your team? Um, I don't really have a favorite team. Um, so I've often in, in, in Virginia, it's always college sports, right? So they spend more time with like, I lived right between UVA and Virginia Tech. So like those two things, that's like the, it's like you're, a, you're either Tech or you're UVA. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I typically just follow players until they get old and they retire. So like it was Isaiah Thomas was a, my favorite player when I was a kid. And then it was Allen Iverson. And now it's LeBron James. So like, I've always looked like whoever that, like, I'm not necessarily like people say you're a bandwagon, you know, a band, bandwagon fan. I'm like, no, I just like that guy. That guy seems like a good person. And I like, seems like a great player. And I want to watch him win. Like, so that's the way I think about it. I got you. I got you. Um, getting back here to, to the uh, Q&A questions. Um, uh, one of the anonymous, uh, one of our anonymous viewers is asking, 
Uh, can you talk about the influence on you, if any, of, of Japanese manga and anime, and uh, you know, if and some of the racial and gender stereotypes uh, that may be in those forms? So um, that's a really complicated question that I talk about a lot in my classes, because I talk about Crumb. I talk about, you know, I use this book, um, I use bits and pieces of this book called Famous Artist Cartoon Course, um, which was written in the 1940s and 50s and like 50s and 60s and maybe 50s altogether. But, um, and the language in it is very antiquated and misogynistic. And, you know, Crumb had a tendency to paint and draw, I mean, draw women, um, be misogynist in his drawings and racist in his drawings and sometimes like uh, intersectionality of racism and, um, and misogyny, misogynoir. So like, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of that in those works, but I feel like, and I use this metaphor a lot, and I was just telling my students this the other day, when we talk about these things, like just imagine our society as a block of aged cheddar, right? So when I look at manga, when I look at manga and I look at anime, I imagine it as like a block of, of aged cheddar. Somebody gave you a block of aged cheddar that they've been aging for years. And if you're not lactose intolerant and you can actually eat the cheese, you're really excited about it, right? But it's gonna be encased in mold, right? You don't throw the whole thing out. You cut the mold off, right? Because once you cut off the bad parts, there's some good stuff at its core, right? And so like, that's the way I think about manga and anime and even like 19th and 20th century cartooning. Like there's lots of racist stereotypes, but the way they, those guys control, com, um, you know, co like composed panels is something that I want to take out of that. I don't want to take the racist stereotypes, but I want to take the way they do, um, they do um, panels. You know, I don't want to take the racist stereotypes from Japanese manga, but I do want to away, take away how storytelling works when you're looking at Osama awesome, awesome Tezuka. Like, I really want that to be a part of what I do. And the cartooning um, in 1950s and 60s anime um, manga is amazing. It's an amazing thing. And the storytelling is amazing. So you want to take that stuff out. And so just like advice from your mother-in-law, sometimes you want to listen to some of it, but you don't have to listen to all of it. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, uh, and another another question that we have from uh, from an anonymous uh, user is, uh, can you can you recommend any examples of uh, interact interactive graphic novels? Um, interactive is is I don't know I don't I don't I don't I guess I, I would have to ask to clarify that question uh, because I'm not sure what you mean by interactive um, graphic novels, but you could definitely spend some time on webtoons, um, which is uh, just just web comics. Um, there are lots of people out there who are doing things. Um, I can't think of anything that's interactive specifically. Um, I know that there are people who are doing things that are a little bit more, um, that are meta. Like I know Ron Wimberly does this, this, this magazine called The Lab, um, just did a Kickstarter that went live and it's fully funded. So it's L-A-A-B. Um, if you open it up, it's got comics in it. It's got it's got comics, it's got prose, it's got short stories, it's got all this different stuff in it, and it's really beautiful. So that's kind of stuff you could look at. But I would say web comics and um, and maybe look at the lab, L A A B. I got you. Um, here's a question from uh, that we have from Kaylin. Uh, Kaylin asks, "What is your art process? Is there a certain art program you use? Do you hand draw your storyboards before you make the scenes digital?" Um, and what's your ideal environment to draw? Is there a go-to snack, drink, or music that helps you focus? Um, so all of those things have different answers. So, um, when I draw, I typically draw on Clip Studio Paint. Um, that's because Clip Studio has, oh, so, so I use Photoshop, I teach Photoshop, but I use Clip Studio Paint and I use Photoshop too. But I always explain Clip Studio Paint and Photoshop is like the difference between a mom and pop woodworking shop and Lowe's. Like if you go to Lowe's looking for woodworking stuff, you can find just about anything you're looking for specifically in Lowe's, but you're gonna have to walk around a whole lot and you're gonna have to ask a couple of people before you can find it. If you go to a woodworking shop, it's all gonna be right there in front, right? And so I think Clip Studio Paint is kind of like a woodworking shop for comics, right? It's got all of the things you need, some of the things you never even knew you needed until you started working on it. Um, but I typically do lettering in, um, in Photoshop because the lettering engine is a little bit better. Photoshop's brush engine is better than Clip Studio Paint, but it's not enough of a difference for me to deal with like all of the, like there's so many things that are made easy by Clip Studio Paint. Um, I typically, I mean, I go back and forth between drawing in my sketchbook, drawing on my iPad, 
drawing on my phone. I just work a number of different ways on all of those things. And I feel like switching back and forth between those things sometimes actually helps my process. So if I get stuck and I'm doing digital thumbnails, I'll go to my sketchbook and do thumbnails. If I get stuck doing thumbnails there, I might, you know, like I just go back and forth. Sometimes I'll just stop and just draw random stuff, like those kind of things. Um, um, I don't typically, so, I mean, I guess thumbnails and storyboards are similar. Um, so I do thumbnails that are in my sketchbook and um, digitally. And um, I don't necessarily have an ideal, like, environment to draw. Um, there are things that are really difficult to draw. Like, there was one story that I was going to put in Strange Fruit Volume 2, but I had just finished drawing, um, I think I had just finished drawing Bessie Stringfield or something. I had been drawing, so I drew, horses are really difficult to draw. Motorcycles are really diff difficult to draw. To draw, did two books where that's all I drew was horses and motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And so there was a story about these, um, these bicycle riders that were um, these, this black regiment of bicycle riders that were trying to get the idea that a safety bike could be used in the military. And so they rode from Montana to New Orleans or something. For, it was like 1500 miles or something. It was crazy. And they did it before there were roads. And, um, and so I was like, that's an amazing story. And I wanted to put it in Strange Fruit, but I didn't want to draw bicycles then. <laughs> so I didn't, I left it out because I'm like, I'm not drawing bicycles. <laughs> um. And I, I think one, just to follow up on that, uh, to the question, uh, is there a favorite snack, a go-to snack to help you? Um, no, not really. Um, you know, depends on like, it depends on how much I've been, like how long I've been drawing and what, like sometimes, uh, sometimes whiskey is really important. <laughs> <laughs> just depends like i won't do that early in the morning um but um coffee and whiskey are often important parts of my process <laughs> i got you um so, uh, sandy chin uh, has another question um sandy asks uh is it important to promote young it's important to promote young artists and, and their talents um did you have a teacher who inspired you encouraged you uh, was it an art teacher english teacher or just uh, was there somebody who helped guide you along the way so, I mean, yeah, I mean, there was, I had some, I had some really bad teachers, which I write about in fights, but I also had some really great teachers. Um, and I, like I had a, you know, I, and I wouldn't say that there were any that really inspired me until I got to college. Um, I had a professor in college, Brian Siva King, who still teaches in Virginia, who was just fantastic. Like, you know, I, I remember in college thinking he was like the smartest man in the world. And I, now I just realized I was just really stupid. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, like he really inspired me, like the way the way he thought about it. I had another professor who was a ceramics professor, um, Scott Hardwick, who um, who was also really fantastic. Um, like just like he was just the kind of person that like wouldn't just take any. I like remember one time we were because he he taught ceramics, but he also taught um, um, 20th century art and architecture. And I remember one time I was in his ceramics class. I mean, it was in his 3D design class. And I was thinking we had to do this block of plaster and we had to carve it down. And I was, and I thought to myself, I'm like, um, so I said, Professor Hardwick, can I just paint, can I make, make this block and just paint a red circle on it and call it minimalist? And like, this was like his, the answer that he gave me in that was so, so quintessential who he was. He was like, yes, but you better damn well be able to prove it. <laughs> So like he would just like legitimately just made you think like that was just the way you thought of it, like the way it, it works. So um, and I think both of the teachers, those two teachers specifically may like really define me, define me questioning and moving forward in my work. And so like that was that was really important. I got you. And I guess how, how just how important is it to have um, mentors in general? super important like if you can't like if you can't just like get a teacher that's a mentor like look for them in the in the world um comics and cartooning is a really small it's a small community but it's it's definitely 100 percent a community and i can tell you 100 percent now i've met very few, few terrible people in comics and most of the people i can talk to you about that i know who are you know like a, a really good you know comics homie of mine is nate powell who wrote um wrote March with John Lewis and Andrew Aiden. Both of those guys are like really, really good people, like just like the best kind of people. And John Jennings, who is the head of um, Megascope Publishing at Abrams, who's a, who's a cartoonist, is like, 
is just like the like these are just like they're just such good like these are the kind of people you want to like be the godparents of your children right these are those kind of people like and and i've met so many people like that steve Bissett, who is who drew um swamp thing all through the 80s is just like just like one of the sweetest like these are all just really good people i can't I, like i will want i cannot tell you I cannot think of anybody right now. And I'm trying to think that, that, that is a cartoonist or comic book person that I've met. And I'm like, Oh, that person's terrible. Or that's a, that's a, like, I can't, I just like, I just can't do it. Like I can't come up with anything. I got you. I got you. Uh, Joel, we, we have a lot of really great questions that, that we still have, but we're running out of time. And I just wanted to give my colleague, Jamie, um, one more, one more chance to talk to our audience today about, about GBH and, uh, and all the good things we have going on there. So I'm gonna bring Jamie on one more time before we have to go. Hi there, everybody. Um, so now, more than ever, it's crucial to stay informed of what is happening in the world. And your backing helps GBH provide information you can trust, along with events like Ask the Expert to enjoy. Show your support of GBH when you're out running errands, walking the dog, or simply relaxing and having a good time by wearing this now vintage WGBH t-shirt before the W is gone for good. You will look good and feel good wearing it, I promise. Simply go to wgbh.org slash support events today. Every dollar you give certainly does make a difference. And we thank you for joining us today. And now back to Esteban with some closing words. Yeah. Uh, well, Joel, um, again, we, we, we only have a few more minutes left. Uh, I just want to thank you again for, for coming on and speaking with us. Um, what's, uh, what's in the works for you now? What, 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 do, you got, what do you got going on and what, what are you sort of excited about uh, here heading into the future for you? Um, I'm working right now, like every all night and day on Stamp from the Beginning, a definitive history of racist ideas in America. If you haven't read it, I have a copy of it that fell over during our talk, but I'm doing this 529 page history tome and I'm turning it into a 250 page graphic novel which that's like taking up all of my time so like my days start out with listening to it and then I sit down and read a little bit of it and then I start drawing and thumbnailing and that's that's pretty much what I do all day every day I have another book coming out in, in February another in the tales of the talented 10th series I did a story about Robert Smalls who was an enslaved African who um who stole the Confederate warship, the planter, and sailed it through Confederate waters to the Union. That book will be out in February from Fulcrum Publishing. So that's what, I, that's, that's what I've got going now. I've I had a book out every year for like, except for one year for the past like seven or eight years. I got you, I got you. Um, one last question before we have, before we have to sign off. Uh, is there any, is, is there any uh, person from history that you haven't got to yet that you're like, that's, that's who I want. That's, that's, that's the next person I want. I so want. there's a guy called Black Herman who was basically like a snake oil salesman and like a, um, he was on like this traveling circuit where he would do magic, magic tricks and like he would heal people and like always just like, you know, like the, the whole thing, his name is Black Herman. Uh, and I want to say that um, there was a famous, I want to say Ella Fitzgerald was a backup singer for him at one time and somebody asked her about him on a radio program and she was like, he owes me money. Uh, <laughs> and there, after, even after he died, people would send messages in black newspapers to him, like, can you help me find a ring? And they did, people didn't believe that he had actually died when he died. So they actually set up a, this funeral and charged admission to his funeral. Um, so, um, I want to figure out how to draw him, but he was like a shady character. And so yeah. I want to figure out how to put him in a story because I want to do a story about Black Herman. Maybe it's an entire book about Black Herman. That yeah. would be great. So, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see, uh, your, your, uh, graphic novel on, on Black Herman, uh, in yeah. story, uh, sometime, sometime soon, but Joel, again, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to all everybody who, who, uh, who watched today. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Um, but thank you for, for everybody's support of GBH. And, uh, and we, will, we hope to see you again on the next uh, rendition of Ask the Expert. Uh, Joel, thank you again and, and good luck. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you.